and South Africa's Gini coefficient is about 0 0.7. So uh, there's still room <laughs> to go. Uh, by way of uh, beginning the talk itself, I'm going to cover the questions as they were posed to us as a panel. Yeah? I want to make uh, two acknowledgments up front, and that is, unfortunately, we've not been party to the luckiness of Adrian and Adrian <laughs> uh, at the STEP Center, but uh, the work that they've presented and what we've seen uh, elicits a lot of resonance with the work that we are doing, and we look forward to a collaboration going forward. Second point is, uh, and I must say this uh, without prejudice, I do not have the arrogance to speak on behalf of a continent of a billion people. So I offer you a view from the small part at the bottom called South Africa, yeah? And I'm going to cover the following six issues within the time allocated to me. As I go through them, I'm not going to read out the question again for you. That's your uh, exercise. I'll deal with the substantive matters written underneath it. In all of this, and I really encourage you to keep the whole picture together as it emerges. Because at the end, on slide six, I would like you to consider some possible research challenges that emerge from these slides. So keeping that openness is uh, quite important. Okay. Of course, we know this, and we've heard it right across the week, that global inequalities continue to rise. But increasingly, as well, we need to recognize that the disparities, in some instances, are supranational, yeah? in terms of regional disparities as countries integrate and cooperate. This is not true across the world. It's uneven. Second point, to recognize within the notion of grow, uh, rising global inequalities, is that emerging very significantly, and you're, I hope you don't mind, especially to people that own the English language, intranational divisions are rising. Inside countries, we're seeing greater cleavages. Uh, part of explaining the rise of these inequalities is, of course, an uneven distribution uh, of infrastructures, especially in the so-called boom period post the last World War. Hmm? And within that, the accumulation specifically of bases of capabilities have largely mimicked the international division of labor. Yeah? Towards this end, they've tended then to accentuate and perpetuate divisions that existed before this time. In other words, the, the period that we call, Dinesh raised it as freedom fighters in India. <laughs> Maybe we humble that a little bit to say, at least fighting for national liberation initially. <laughs> Post-national liberation, I'm not so sure we've advanced towards freedom as much as we want. And that speaks to the next bullet point, that con concurrently at the moment, we face a multiplicity of crises. These crises happen at the same time and they're not single crises. They are interpenetrated between environment, the so-called financial crisis, the real economic crisis, crisis around speculation on food. They all work together to create a very bad situation for us. But more importantly, they've tended towards paralyzing instruments of global governance. So whereas maybe the UN said no to the introduction before, Today, probably the UN wouldn't give you an answer <laughs> or ask you to wait for one. Yeah. As you all know, we expect this towards the end of the year as well. The last bullet point around this notion of contemporary innovation dynamics is a challenge back to all of us. And I've heard this individually from people speaking to me throughout the week. Yeah. We live in an, a special time at the moment. Yeah. And during this time, we see rising popular struggles and we need to be able to engage with this tide as well. We are part of that 99%, at least from what I've seen during the week itself. <laughs> yeah. I've not seen that many VIP vehicles outside or blue lights taking me down to the hotel. <laughs> All right, in terms of moving ahead from that uh, picture, uh, we should encourage increasingly uh, more participatory processes, and we can use instruments that come from our fields, even from the Institute, 
that STEPS is al uh, aligned with. Uh, we learned in South Africa a lot about foresight from SPRU. Yeah. And maybe the, the possibilities now emerge for us to consider doing foresight together, as opposed to doing foresight for the object of national uh, competitiveness. Why? Because the crises that affect us affect all of us. I love this when people talk about national security being achieved and people breaking oil dependence. It's as if that will fix the world. Yeah. Second point in that, and that builds upon this increasingly, and this community of Globelix has helped facilitate this incredibly, and that's around global cooperation towards regional integration, and within that, discerning national responsibilities. Yeah. This affords us a new way of looking at planning. This is not planning as in the plan. This is planning where people own both the problems and solutions. And we in this community, I think, have a responsibility towards contributing towards those types of plans. Yeah. And within that, we can also learn from some of the practices that inform some of the work we do. And this includes issues of auditing uh, processes, improving foresight, and more importantly, not just looking at outputs and impacts, but also outcomes of the issues that we actually invest in. Okay, moving ahead, you will remember, you, you are please expected to read the questions. <laughs> I'm only providing tentative answers towards these. Yeah. And that is a lot of future growth is often positioned on this notion of emergent, the emergent new middle class. But I would encourage you, especially in the worlds that you actually occupy, the realities that you live in, to notice the precariousness of this new middle class. Yeah. Because even the old middle class is living a precarious existence as it's confronted by austerity. Yeah. And its ability to hold that standard of living and consumption patterns may not hold for an extremely long time. Yeah. Within this, the notion of a grow rising global political consciousness is amongst us. It's what's happening in the north of Africa, it's happening across the Middle East, it's happening in our own societies right around us here at the moment. And these reflect both institutional dissatisfaction, but primarily driven by increasing unemployment. And issues of employment are not just issues around the labor market and labor market reforms. They also involve issues of skills. And towards that end, I think we have an opportunity to contribute. Yeah. We are not disconnected from the processes around Rio plus 20. Yeah. In fact, from amongst our community, there are quite a few participating with the World Social Forum, amongst others, in preparing perspectives around technology and innovation for that conference. Yeah. In fact, in Argentina on Friday, there's such a meeting between NGOs, trade unions, and the ministry is responsible. <laughs> Uh, that brings us to the challenge of whether the solutions we provide actually seek merely to green the existing accumulation parts, in other words, make consumption greener, or are we talking about something radically different, a green economy? Okay. Close to the end, and this is about enterprise, entrepreneurship, and systems. Uh, we need to be careful, and I think Peng Toki had raised this earlier with us, and also uh, Hernan in his presentation, uh, the notion around ameliorative action and welfare. Yeah? Creative destruction also enjoins us towards uprooting fundamental orthodoxies. Yeah? And in this, we've heard many times the, the cases that accentuate localization, employment opportunities, and the idea around public infrastructures. So, towards conclusions, last slide, and this is the part that I encouraged you, to at least leave the possibility open for. Please, please change the slide. Ah, sorry. Thank, thank you. See. Yeah. And this is when we think about the future collectively and as the work around manifestos, charters, etc. arise. Yeah. Maybe we should encourage pathways to think of alternatives also freed of the systems that constrain us at the moment. Yeah. And with the first notion around post-capitalist opportunities, the second point uh, also correlates by what Dinesh raised, and I'm sure colleagues would, 
contribute to this the increasing literature about the importance of open innovation, especially in the context of global cooperation. Yeah? It's not just open systems or open source. It's much bigger than that. The notion around direct democracy, and this is just a play on words, I think you'll hear the import of it. Left-sizing the bureaucracy, <laughs> these things that hold us back. Yeah. There's an appropriateness that's attached to this. This is not necessarily to castigate the whole public because of the last slide, and this I think is the key challenge around. For us to have public accountability also means we need to relook at the notion of public goods themselves. Yeah. And within this, all of us owe an obligation, both to the generations before us, all of those very proud freedom fighters, to take forward an issue around intergenerational custodianship. Yeah. We are holding the space for generations to come. The planet cannot continue as it is, especially with us wreaking havoc. So thank you very much. <laughs>